Dr. Barnabas Asper, thanks so much for taking the time for this today. Well, thanks for coming in. As, as you can see, we're not in your normal space. No, we are not, which actually works out well because we're in the process of moving. So this was perfect. Um, but I do want to just say a thanks to St. Mary's Seminary for, for doing this. Could you tell us a little bit about where we're at? Uh, so we're at St. Mary's Seminary and University, which is proud of calling itself the oldest Catholic seminary in America, perhaps even in North America, I don't know. And uh, it was founded in 1791 and has been going ever since, Wow! training Catholic priests. I believe that there are more Catholic priests in America who came, who are graduates from St. Mary's than from any other Catholic seminary in America. That's wonderful, and I can vouch that it is absolutely beautiful here. Uh, tucked away in this kind of, I guess we're like northwest Baltimore here. Um, but it was stunning coming onto the campus today, a real pleasure. You all also have an ecumenical institute here, and I thought that could be an interesting place to start our conversation of just what does good ecumenism look like? And, and I want to maybe lay out a bit of a spectrum, uh, and, and maybe there's more beyond this. But when, when I see people talk about ecumenism, I, I see essentially like three kind of approaches to mm -hmm. this conversation. On the one hand, there is kind of this idea that ecumenism should just be figure out who's right and everyone else get in line, right? <laughs> uh, so we can put that on, on one end of the ecumenism spectrum. Ecumenism means persuading everyone that my version of Christianity is the right one. Correct. <laughs> and so maybe on the other end of the spectrum, we could have something of let's flatten all of our differences and get along as best we can. Maybe somewhere in the middle you have something like let's learn from one another, maintaining our own kind of distinctiveness, mm -hmm. but seeking to understand the other side. So from your perspective, and obviously if it is a spectrum, there's lots of points along that, but what does faithful ecumenism look like? That's a very good um, question, a good place to start. I mean, I think if we think about the virtuous person and what it means to be just uh, somebody of character, I would start with ecumenism just only working if the people involved are people of character, people who know how to listen, to respond well, who when they're debating they're seeking the truth rather than just to defeat the opponent or to get one up somehow. So I think but ecumenism really has to start with the individual cultivating virtue in their life. They need to learn how to listen, they need to learn how to res show respect for positions not their own, um, to disagree well, as it were, and to, to see the dialogue as all of us seeking the truth on the journey together. I think you highlighted a couple of really important things there of both listening well, which I think is a difficult thing in an age where we're trained to just spat out our opinions as fast mm -hmm. as we can and as broadly and widely as we can, but also learning to disagree well. Mm -hmm. Because I think in some instances, we become a bit allergic to disagreement in so far as we, we don't want to offend. And in some cases, I think people see disagreement almost as kind of a, an act of, like, uh, and depending on the circle, like almost like a violence toward the other person, right? Yeah. That I think you're wrong, and that somehow is, is attacking. And so how, what does disagreeing well look like in a theological context? Because I think what people maybe watching this might get concerned about at times is that will either just shout at each other, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, which isn't productive. We have plenty of that. But I also see a lot of people maybe on the slightly more, I guess, traditional or conservative side of things. Those terms are difficult, but who seem to become allergic to ecumenism because they're scared that we will kind of lose our distinctiveness in that. And so mm. what does it look like to, to disagree well, and especially in a, a Christian and, and character, virtue-based way? Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to disagree well, because if the topic that you're disagreeing about is something that you care about and think really matters, then it's very easy to get very emotional about it and very, like, agitated, like, I really have to persuade you that this matters. And that's what happens on social media all the time and in contemporary politics, right? We, we don't have the patience to hear out the other view because we just think the subject matter is so important. So I think disagreeing well uh, starts with the recognition that you're not going to get anywhere by just shouting at the other person. You're not going to persuade them that way. I see a lot of stuff on Twitter, or what should be now called X, where I, I find myself thinking, who do you think you're persuading? <laughs> you're just stating your views, you know. It's, we should start with listening. And disagreeing well means 
recognizing that we're not going to come to full, complete agreement very quickly. Mm -hmm. Patience, I think, is a crucial virtue here. We just have to recognize that it's, we're not going to persuade each other in the first five minutes or in the first few hours or even in the first few days. We have to have a longer conversation and really come to understand each other's views and get to the heart of things. A lot of people just don't have the patience for that. Yeah, I want to zoom out a little bit to what may, maybe you could call like the ecumenical movement. And I think, mm. you know, we have, after the Second Vatican Council, a lot of excitement around ecumenism, yeah. a lot of official dialogues happening, you know, a whole flurry of things for theologians to do. And I think a lot of it was really good. And I think there's been something of maybe a, a cooling down in it at the official level insofar as it seemed like a lot of progress was getting made. And I'd say maybe a, a certain zenith for that would be something like the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification. Yeah, absolutely. Where we have Lutherans and Catholics sitting down together and saying, we can agree to this statement on justification, which I don't think people you know, would have seen coming. And it happened really quite quickly, if you think of, in terms of from Vatican II on to there. Yeah. But I think some people have begun to maybe get discouraged insofar as you have this watershed moment, at least seemingly, right? We come together on this doctrine that is at the heart of the Reformation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think at the time there's people wondering, like, are we going to kind of end the schism? Like, are we going to get all yeah, the way there? Is the Reformation over now? Right. Yeah. And it, it didn't do that. No. And, you know, I guess we're going on 20 years from uh, the JDDJ, uh, long acronym there. Um, <laughs> and, and it doesn't seem like maybe institutionally there's been a whole lot of, of movement since then. Maybe there has been that I'm unaware of. But I guess where I want to come back to with this is you were talking about, you know, agreement or persuasion mm -hmm. takes time, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's not going to happen in five minutes. It might not happen in five years. It might not happen in 500 years mm -hmm. after the Reformation. Mm -hmm. But with that in mind, is the North Star of ecumenism still a full institutional unity between the, tur the churches that have been kind of uh, in schism for so long? Is that is that still the North Star? Because I think some people seeing that we haven't gotten there, despite the the, the, the really like leaps and bounds that have happened, mm. are wondering if that's even ever possible. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, that the question of what the goal of ecumenism is, is one of the questions that we need to figure out, right? Because not everybody agrees yeah. on what the, what the final end is that we're aiming for. Um, so I would say... I, I took over take, teaching the ecumenism course here at St. Mary's when I started here, and I was, I was told by some people here, actually, that there's just not as much appetite for ecumenical dialogue as there used to be. As you said, pe things have cooled down a little bit, and there isn't as much progress or, uh, towards unity as people have been hoping for. And the, I should recognize that I, I, I need to get these seminarians excited or interested or just to care about ecumenical dialogue again, because they might not care about it anymore. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the causes for it, I think, is sure, the, the Joint Declaration on Justification was a huge achievement, a really amazing um, result, and we should celebrate it. And, and as you may know, some of the other church groups have signed up to the same mm -hmm. declaration, the Reformed and the Anglicans and that kind of thing. But um, when, if we go all the way back to the Reformation, we, we would talk about justification as the material cause of the Reformation, right? Mm -hmm. But there was also the formal cause of the Reformation, which had more to do with the question of how you figure out what are the right doctrines in the first place. Mm -hmm. So a slightly more foundational issue there of um, should Scripture alone be the way that we figure out what's true, or should Scripture in, in conjunction with the magisterium or whatever... And to my mind, that's the issue that has caused a whole lot more differences between Catholics and Protestants since then. So that justification is no longer really the primary issue anymore for most people, you know. Yeah. It, since Vatican II, so many other things have happened within the Protestant world that have led Protestants, uh, in some ways further away from each other, but also further away from the Catholic Church in a way that has made ecumenical dialogue a little bit harder. Yeah. So I'd be curious... It, it seems like at least part of the solution then, if we want to continue making progress on this, and it, it seems that it's something that both you and I are interested in. Absolutely. And so it seems as though what you're saying is just solving the particular doctrines mm. is not going to do the job. You know, even if we say justification, we're agreed on that. And maybe we 
come to the next controversial one, you know, flashpoint, yeah, exactly. and we agree on that doctrine. But it seems that you're saying the problem is actually getting underneath of it to how we're approaching these things. Mm -hmm. how, how are we, what is our framework? And, and there's probably some philosophical ideas here, as well as just um, what you might call like prolegomena mm -hmm. in, in theology, right? Like kind of those, uh, those first words, how we're going to approach this. And so, you know, if you were put in charge of kind of leading the ecumenical charge for, for the Catholic Church, right? And you had to say like, this is where we need to drill down on next. What do you think that is? Is it that question of sola scriptura, or is it even broader than that? I would say it's even deeper than that. Yeah. Um, sola scriptura is the position that a number of Protestants, although not every Protestant, uh, now takes on um, on how to acquire, acquire correct doctrine. But I would say the deeper question is, what is the source of divine revelation that we are using to figure out what it means to be Christian? And what are the authorities to convey that revelation to us? Or maybe just one authority, right? Mm -hmm. And I would start there. I would say, what is the authority here? If the authority is just the Bible, um, then where does that lead? If the authority is the Bible and the magisterium, then where does that lead? Uh, revelation, in, in some sense, only has one source, Jesus Christ, right? Mm -hmm. But that source is mediated to us through the Bible. Everybody agrees on that. Is there anything more than just the Bible that mediates that revelation to us? I think that's the key question that we need to answer. And how do we go about answering that? Because one of the ideas that's been floating around in my head recently is that it seems that for many people on, on their kind of path of conversion, before they kind of formally make that decision to convert, prior to that, somewhere along the way, their approach to the questions change. So, for instance, you know, they began asking this question, should I be Protestant or should I be Catholic? Mm. And at some point, you know, maybe a year, two years, five years, however long down the line, they decide I should be Catholic. And within that, they've made this decision of what is the source of authority, right? But how, how do we go about making that decision? Because it seems that to decide what the authority is, we have to be looking at a certain authority, right? Absolutely. So to decide that the church is authoritative, we're probably going to the church as a source for that belief, at least in some way. And so it seems like there's this kind of tricky chicken and egg thing going on here. But how do we go about kind of delving that question? It is difficult. And especially if you talk to like expert church historians, for example, they'll still disagree on what the, how authority worked in the early church, for example. And so I don't think it really solves anything to say, right, I'm going to become an expert on the history of the papacy and figure out whether the Bishop of Rome always had primacy or not. Because even if I delve into the history to like as deep as I can, even if I spend years doing nothing but that, there's still going to be other experts who have spent just as long who disagree with me, right? Mm -hmm. so, so at least in my own personal journey, the, the, the answers came not from, not initially from the past, but from the present situation. Mm -hmm. And to say, what does the church need what is my own felt need to nourish myself spiritually? And how are the various authorities and um, models of how to, uh, how to mediate revelation, how are they actually working? How are they serving the church today? Yeah. You know, so I started off as a pretty normal evangelical, I guess. Uh, that's how I grew up. And when I, when I started to see a lot of disagreements within the evangelical world about various topics, um, hot, hot, hot political topics as well as deeper theological topics, I, I felt my instinct was, okay, I just need to go and learn the Bible really, really well, and I'll figure out all the answers. And that, why was that my instinct? Well, because I was an evangelical. Sure. You know. So I went to Regent College, and I spent three years learning all this Greek and Hebrew and all these principles of exegesis and lots of ancient Near Eastern history and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I started to realize, actually, all of the people I'm reading, even though they've spent many more years than me, and I'm experts in Greek or Hebrew and exegesis far more than I can ever hope to be, they still disagree on all of these doctrines. Mm -hmm. There's still no agreement. So this whole idea of just going back to the Bible doesn't seem to be yielding the fruits of agreement in the church that I was hoping it would lead to. And then I felt like I reached a, a, a turning point in my own journey where I thought, do I want to be just another voice who disagrees with all the other people and thinks my interpretation of the Bible is the right one? 
Is that the goal for my life? Do I just want to be another person who thinks I've figured out what the Bible really says and everybody else is wrong, who disagrees with me? Or do I need to look for some other model? And that's where I found myself hitting up against some of the claims of some of the uh, older churches that had some had a different approach to authority right from the start. That's that's really helpful. And so it sounds like there's almost a certain, I, I don't know if this is a mischaracterization, but a, a pragmatic question involved here as well of like, what what is going to work for the church? Exactly. What, what model works here? One question I want to ask in terms of that journey from, am I going to be this, you know, kind of solitary biblical scholar that yeah. has, has my view over and against all these other views and recognizing that, you know, there's always going to be this difference of opinion, is that, I find a lot of Protestants hearing that, some becoming convinced, but then others going back to the Catholic position and saying, it seems like, you know, it's only one step removed from the kind of question of, okay, we have a magisterium that is living and active and, you know, can clarify things, but then it seems like, especially in the YouTube world, right, like we have people popping up every day who are now the definitive interpreters of said right. magisterium, right? right? And I think, you know, whether it's the, the recent document on fiducia supplicans or really any, right? Yeah, yeah. How do we interpret Vatican II? Um, it, we get kind of this similar thing of we have all of these different camps of how we look at these things. And so how did you think through that question? I mean, I completely agree that the problem of the individual needing to interpret for themselves never really goes away and never really should go away. The question is, what is the larger framework that you're using to help you interpret, right? And, and I think this is where we have to realize that both Catholics and Protestants have both things functioning for themselves at the same time. The Protestant doesn't use their own individual judgment to disagree with Scripture. You know, If they find something in Scripture that seems a bit weird or a bit unlikely or just morally abhorrent to them, the, the evangelical instinct is to say, well, my, in, my intuitions must be wrong the Bible must be right. So we have this understanding of submission to authority, right? And then within the Catholic world, as you pointed out, there's also this understanding of I need to interpret what the authority says for my own life and, and so I can live my own life. And that can help the two sides to come together because they can see that both of those are necessary. What's the difference then between them is that I, I began to feel that within Protestantism, what are the boundaries, what are the interpretive boundaries that I'm working within? Is there, is there some sort of foundation that we're all agreeing on that we can use to help us come to common interpretations of things? And I just didn't see any boundaries to that, mm. you know? I think so, <laughs> but I guess I'd wonder, is that because, so you said you were kind of like broadly evangelical, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's the background I come from as well, so I yeah, very yeah. much relate to that. Yeah. Um, but to maybe kind of like put in a, a question from some of my more like mainline or uh, traditional Protestant, uh, mm -hmm. denominational-wise, Protestant, they might say, well, yeah, you, you could have boundaries. You could have the Westminster Confession of Faith, or mm -hmm. you could have the 39 Articles, or the Augsburg Confession. Mm -hmm. That wasn't convincing to you. Well, I guess if I was to take the Westminster Confession of Faith uh, and, and say, let's try this out as, as a good set of constraints, it would have to answer various questions for me. So I'd have to be convinced that this was a Holy Spirit-inspired uh, sort of text, not, not inspired in the same way that the scripture is, but Holy Spirit guided, perhaps it's a better word I should say, Holy Spirit guided text that I can place all of my trust in, even when things it says I don't particularly like or particularly agree with. And I would have to see the Holy Spirit's guidance over against all of the other traditions and all of the other denominations that don't acknowledge it. So there's a pretty high bar for trust, as it were. Sure. And I, just, I think it's very common for converts like me to say this, but I found myself asking, like, did the church get all of this wrong up until the Reformation? Uh, and where was the Holy Spirit during all of that time? Mm -hmm. And I just wasn't satisfied by any answers that said, well, the Holy Spirit was just kind of kicking his heels, <laughs> letting people wander around in darkness, not understanding the truth, you know? Sure. Until the Westminster Confession comes along or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's... That's helpful, and I think it is certainly something that I, I hear from people along that journey. And, and it makes sense, right? Because yeah. there's, no matter how you, when, no matter what you make of the Reformation, I think it, it's, a, it's a real turning point. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's doing something distinct there. And whether you see it as a, a retrieval of something, you know, long lost, mm -hmm. or a real new break, either way, it's different. And so yeah. you have to say that, that something was going on there. 
I'd be curious kind of in your own story. So you're going through this journey, right? And you're asking these, these really important questions about authority. Is there a tipping point that you can remember, like a, a moment where you said, I've got to become Catholic? There, there certainly was. It was, I don't remember the exact date, but it was in February 2013. Um, because I, I remember I was, I've always felt called to be what I would have at that time said a Bible teacher or like a theologian or somebody who, who guides other Christians into a deeper understanding of their own faith. And I've always felt a sense of responsibility for that. You know, if you read the letter of James, uh, chapter 3, it says, Not many of you should presume to be teachers, because we who teach will be judged more harshly. And I, I, I felt that weight of responsibility. Like, if somebody comes to me and says, How should I live my life? I'm gay, what should I do? Or I wanna, I'm a woman and I want to become a pastor, what should I do? Or any kind of big question about how they should live the, their life, I'd better be really sure that I'm giving them the right answer. Because I might be condemning them to a whole world of pain, or to a whole world of sin, uh, if the answer I give is wrong. And so because of that, I felt an increasing responsibility to be absolutely certain that the doctrines I was teaching were correct. And I started to feel that there was too much based on me and on my own intelligence. I basically had to think, well, I'm just smarter than everybody else. I figured this out better than all of the other people. And that's my basis for thinking that I'm right, mm -hmm. you know? There was a moment when I was I was sitting in the living room of Professor Hans Bursma. I think you've had him ah, on the show. Yes. You? Okay. Yeah. Uh, and we were talking a little bit about how you interpret the tradition and how a lot of the elements that we see in even in the modern secular world came from Christianity. Like even things like um, gay rights movement is rooted in certain Christian notions of human rights and human dignity. Even if a Christian or, or traditional Christian might not agree with them, you can still recognize that they have Christian inspiration to them. We were talking about that, and then I found myself saying, well, how do I arbitrate between all of these different versions of Christianity, both secular and, and explicitly Christian? And he said, well, we're not called to arbitrate as theologians. We're called to um, faithfully pass on what has been given to us. We are the passers on of a tradition that we didn't invent we didn't create this. It didn't come out of our own heads. It was given to us, and our job is to pass it on. And I found that was a turning point for me because I found that I had construed my own self-understanding as I have to figure out the truth out of my own head and then tell it to everybody else. Whereas what I was being offered was a model of what a teacher is, is somebody who doesn't figure, who doesn't determine what Christianity is. We don't choose what Christianity is. We just faithfully pass it on humbly. Mm -hmm. And I, I and by the time I had reached a point where I saw that those are the two options, it was obvious which one I should take. You know? Yeah. I'm a faithful servant of the tradition, not an inventor. And I think that's that's a really beautiful thing. I want to ask a question under that question, perhaps Absolutely, in yeah. the spirit of this conversation, right? In yeah. the spirit of what good ecumenism is. Absolutely. And that is so I think a lot of people be attracted to that idea. And yeah, I think yeah, yeah. Uh, you know Pretty much everything Hans Borsma says makes me go like, "That's deep. That's one." <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, but there is, there's kind of this question under that question of so I can either try to invent this or figure this out for myself, right? Or I can yeah. be a faithful passer on of the tradition. Yeah. But in order to be a faithful passer on of the tradition, you have to discern the tradition. Absolutely. What is tradition and what is not? Absolutely. And so, within that, you could say I'm a faithful, you know, passer on of the Orthodox tradition, absolutely, uh, of the Catholic tradition of you know, and you have different options, and so. Once you've made that decision of, you know, I want to be a faithful kind of passer on of the tradition, what are the steps to discern that tradition properly? Okay, I found this interview fascinating, and we'll be right back to it. But real quick, I just want to put in a plug, actually, for Dr. Asprey's podcast. I listen to a ton of podcasts, and I get tired of a lot of them pretty quickly. And when I realized afterwards that he had a podcast, and that it's absolutely incredible, I thought it's, an, it's a crime that we didn't mention in this episode. So what you need to do after you listen to this is click on the link in the description down below, check out his podcast, Faith at the Frontiers. Honestly, they unearth questions in there that I think are so, so important. They talk about history and the Bible. They talk about science and religion. They're talking about these fascinating things with the best scholars in the world, and I'm devouring the podcast, and I think you will too. Okay, back to the interview. Yeah, that's right. And the, 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 the principle of private judgment, it's called, right, uh, can't be avoided at some level. And I know you've talked about this on your show before. You're, 
your video, uh, Five Bad Arguments for Catholicism. Oh. I, really, uh, oh, I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> and, and, and the second one was, who are you to judge the church, right? Um, and, the, and your riposte was, well, we have to make a judgment in order to decide to enter the church. So there's private judgment somewhere. There's an individual uh, discernment that has to take place somewhere. Absolutely, I completely agree. Uh, I mean, first of all, I'd like, uh, just at the principle at the philosophical level there, I'd like to say that I, I tend to compare it to the principle of individual judgment that you use when, when you're sick and you choose to go to the doctor. Let's say the doctor says some, prescribes some remedy to your sickness that is, you think is really weird. You're like, oh, if you want to get better from the sickness, you have to stand on your head and sing, or something like that, and you're like, that doesn't make any sense to me. Now, my individual judgment is at work there because I have to choose whether to accept what this doctor is saying and do it or whether to reject it because it just seems nonsense to me. So my individual judgment, I, and I think most people would say, well, the doctor's a trained doctor. They know more than I do. So in my judgment, the doctor's judgment is superior to my judgment. Now, there's nothing paradoxical there, right? You can just say, I'm just using my judgment to recognize the limits of my own ability to judge and to submit to the judgment of somebody else. That's the principle that, to me, makes this thing not really a paradox or not really a contradiction. But then there's another question you had in there, which is, well, well, how, what did you use to judge which tradition to submit to, right? And there's a lot of traditions. There's the Anglican tradition. Uh, you know, I'm in America now, uh, uh, but I grew up in England, and... Uh, everybody who meets me thinks, oh, you used to be Anglican, right? And I have to tell them, no, I was never Anglican, actually. Um, but the Anglican tradition is a big, wide tradition. I think it's the third largest tradition after Catholic and Orthodox. Why not submit to that? Why not submit to the Orthodox tradition? How do you decide? Absolutely. And this is where I would say another element of my story comes in. I wanted to see the real fruit of unity, hmm. right? And a unity that was not just rooted in past confessions, but in how to disagree well within a wider unified space. So I look at the Anglican tradition. And I say, well, in terms of what you have to believe to be Anglican, there's not much there. Not right? much at all. There's not much guidance. And my soul was looking for guidance over and above my own intelligence, recognizing the limits of my intelligence. I was like, the Anglican church is not going to guide me into the truth, it's still going to hand me back the responsibility to figure it all out for myself. What about the Orthodox Church? Well, I took the Orthodox Church very seriously for a number of years, and I told you that moment in 2013, when I, when I realized I had to faithfully pass on the tradition, I hadn't decided which tradition at that point. So it comes down to, again, what does my soul need? If I look at the Orthodox Church, and I look at the Orthodox ecclesial hierarchy, there's, there's some problems there, right? Everybody admits that there's some problems there. At the moment, the, the Russian patriarch has excommunicated the patriarch of Constantinople, something like that, and that there, there's some disagreement. And they tried to have uh, an ecumenical council in 2016, the first pan-Orthodox council. Uh, that was going to be like the first Orthodox ecumenical council since the, like, 17th, uh, the 7th century, right? Mm -hmm. It didn't work. Why didn't it work? Well, not all of the Orthodox patriarchs went to it because they didn't want to accept it as a council, right? So that shows that there's some deep problems in questions of authority and hierarchy and who actually gets to decide how we move forward as a church that I don't see solved in the Orthodox church. So that really leaves only one option left, right? <laughs> yeah. If we look at a functional unity that can make real decisions about what everybody in that community is going gonna, is gonna to do going forward or believe going forward. Uh, you can disagree within that, and there's lots of disagreement within that, but there's a functional set of principles that we're all unified on. There's really only one church left, or at least one, one church that has roots in the tradition. I see. I want to highlight one thing that seems to have been a bit of a theme throughout mm. this, and I, I think it's an important one. You brought up, uh, I think you used the word certainty, or this kind of uh, uh, yes. this, this kind of quest for 
at least kind of assurance that, that what you're passing on is faithful, right? Mm -hmm. And that you're not leading people in, into error. And you brought up James there as well, which I think is absolutely true. And sometimes terrifies me when I think of the number of people that have watched these videos. <laughs> I, I try not to think of that. Um, I, I prefer to just realize that we're in a room with cameras and that's it. <laughs> um, but I think most of the people that watch my videos will agree with that. I think the people that are attracted to the type of work that I do, they're people like me who endlessly hunt down questions and want certainty. I, I greatly desire it, and it mm -hmm. sounds like you do as mm -hmm. well. But there are also people who I see, they go through this journey, and especially for people that kind of stay stuck in this questioning phase for a long time, and I recognize mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a pool on myself, that there's this element where they say, maybe certainty is just too high of a bar for mm -hmm. what we'll have in theology. Mm -hmm. maybe, um, maybe I won't reach that. And I think, you know, it, it couples with this idea of, of private judgment insofar as people see... You know, and I, in some ways, I think this is maybe a defect of my channel. It's both a, a it's, it's it's greatest strength and greatest weakness is that it brings on really intelligent people from different traditions, mm -hmm. and then people see there are people that are smarter than me on each of these sides, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I will never be able to out argue any of them. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, on the one hand, it's you know I don't know how to decide in that way, but it, I think it leads some people to kind of despair of certainty in theology mm -hmm. in general that mm -hmm. maybe it's all just provisional. Is that something that ever was drawing on you, or what made you say to people in that situation? Yeah, I did use the word certainty. I probably shouldn't have, actually. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, I won't hold you to it. No, perhaps what I should have said was I need to have a basis in my uh, the guidance I'm offering other people that is mm -hmm. not just my own brain and yeah. my own smarts, because, as you said, there's always really smart people who disagree. Um, it, on the question of certainty, I mean, there are a lot of people who become Catholic because they see a, a, a possibility there for certainty that they don't see anywhere else. Um, Scott McKnight did this whole uh, survey of yes. evangelical converts to Catholicism, you know, this, and looking at unity, authority, certainty, and don't remember the fourth one. Something. I wouldn't say that I'm certain. Okay. I've studied too much philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I don't really think of certainty as, as uh, depending on how you define it, I don't really think of it as something that the human mind is capable of. Mm -hmm. You, you might always find out in the future that you were wrong. You never know what might change your views, change your presuppositions, change your way of thinking. You just never know. You know, I remember meeting, when, when I was working in London once, I had a colleague who was an atheist, and she told me, nothing is ever going to change my mind on my certainty that God doesn't exist. And I thought, how do you know the future? <laughs> yeah. None of us know the future. So I wouldn't say I'm certain. Uh, I would rather say, talk about it in terms of likelihood. Is it likely that I or somebody in my own time has finally figured out what Christianity is really all about and everybody else has got it wrong before? Is that likely? Well, I'm, if I'm quite arrogant, then I perhaps think it's more likely. <laughs> but it's not about certainty for me. It's more about um, finding something that I can trust that is not my own intelligence. Yeah. I want to bridge two ideas here then. Yeah. Um, so I tend to agree with that. Yeah. And I've said on my channel before that, you know, when I set out on this, trying to discern the tradition, if you will, mm. and figure out, you know, in what, what church I should belong, which is still something that I'm trying to figure out. Uh, who knows how long that will take. But, you know, I, I was looking for certainty. And mm -hmm. I was thinking that if I, if I read enough, if I study enough, uh, I'll just know. Yeah. I'll know for sure, yeah. um, you know, which is true. And I'll just become a parent in that way. And the longer I've gone through this, the more I've become convinced uh, that I'll never have like a 100% certainty on these questions, but it will be somewhat probabilistic, somewhat mm -hmm. this seems more true than the alternatives. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I agree with that there. The question I want to bridge that with is the compatibility of my own kind of lack of certainty with dogmatic certainty from the church mm -hmm. in some ways. And so, um, and what I mean here is if I can't be certain, you can't mm -hmm. be certain, but can the, the church be certain in that way? So I think some people would say, you know, does that lead us then to the point of, well, we, we shouldn't have dogmas because is, theolo is theology inherently uncertain? I don't think you take that position. And so I kind of want to bridge the gap. Yeah, there. yeah. 
I mean, certainty can be defined a number of ways. And sure. I, I don't think that when the church talks about its own certainty, it means the sort of scientific in, it like impossibility to disprove something or to think differently. Because I think if the church was really talking about that, then it shouldn't be talking about faith as well, right? Mm. It, there's always an element of faith, which means it's not rationally provable. Um, hang on, what, now, what were you just saying? Uh, the church is dogma, that's it. You yes. used the word dogma. I don't see dogma as being about certainty. Now, I'll have to unpack that. Sure. Um, and maybe I'll just throw in another word if it's yeah, helpful. Yeah, yeah. Infallibility. Okay, yeah. Infallibility. Um, well, let's move. Let's talk about dogma first yeah. and then go to infallibility. So dogma, as you probably know, comes from the Greek word dokein, which means to seem, right? Um, dogma. It seems to me that dogma has to do with the foundations of your worldview, mm. the lens through which you look at the world. I look at the world through the lens of uh, the belief that Christ is divine, for example. Um, it doesn't mean you can't doubt it. It doesn't mean you can't question it. It just means that that is the DNA of what being a Christian is. And if you do lose belief in it, what you're losing belief in is Christianity in its essence. That's what I think dogma is. So if you think about it, an atheist has dogma in the sense that the definition of an atheist is not believing in God. And that doesn't mean an atheist can't acquire belief in God. They can. But if they do, they're not an atheist anymore. Mm. So I'd say the dogma of the church is the absolute essentials that define what it means to be in that church, without which you're not in that church. Sure. Yeah? In a way that almost seems like a kind of sociological explanation in, in some ways, right? Like yeah. what it means to belong to a community. Yeah. Um, I find that attractive in so far as the way I think about these things. But is that fair to characterize in that way? Sociological. I don't... I, well... I do think there's a sociological element there, but really I just meant um, uh, I just meant the defining essential features sure. of, a like of a particular irreducible or particular belief yeah. system. It doesn't even have to be a community, really. Yeah. You know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And when we talk about infallibility, um, I really struggle with with the word infallible again because I just study so much philosophy. I'm like, what does it even mean? It ruins everything. Can't possibly. In the best way. Yeah. There's no room for error. Like. Um, if there was no room for error, then we shouldn't be talking about faith. <laughs> mm. Faith means I'm trusting that this is true, even though I can't possibly be certain, even sure. though it's not rationally provable. Um, I would sp I would put it this way: people talk about biblical infallibility, right? Uh, that's something the Catholics and Protestants can can share a discussion on. I don't see it as my role to ever disagree with the Bible. I don't know if the Bible has errors or not. I'm never going to know. But I don't see myself as having the authority to disagree with something Scripture mm -hmm. says. I choose to live my life as if everything in Scripture is correct, even though I'm never going to know whether it's correct or not. So can I apply this to yeah. kind of a personal question, but also one that I think will be relevant, because it, it gets a lot of airtime in discussions between Catholics and Protestants, Maybe unjustly, maybe justly. Mm -hmm. um, but something I've brought up is that one of the barriers for me of becoming Catholic has been that, and I people hate when I say this, but I say, like, I'm simply not convinced mm -hmm. uh, of certain... Non-resistant, kind of, non-convinced. <laughs> yeah. you're, you're more well-versed in my videos than I anticipated. Oh, I did I'm, my homework before I can. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. Um, but, yes, exactly, that idea of, you know, I intellectually just not convinced of, say, like, the... Uh, the actualness, if it's actual, actuality, uh, of something like Mary's uh, assumption, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but it seems to me that with uh, in what you're saying, and I could be wrong, um, but that you could to have that type of doubt in it, but say, I simply don't have the authority to say it didn't happen, to say that the church is wrong in this. Is that how you would approach a question like this? Or would you say, it gets into questions of assent, I suppose, mm. um, that, that to be Catholic you, you do have to actually believe that that is the case and that you're not allowed to disagree. What is belief, then? How would you define belief? Ah, this is a good question. I'm, an, I'm usually the one asking questions. No. I, I, I like to teach Socratically. Ah, yes, okay. So, belief here, I would say, would be a conviction um, that something is true. Mm -hmm. And so I am 
internally convinced, mm -hmm. um, which is an idea that I've been playing around with a lot in just terms of what does it actually take to convince something. Um, but in any case, it, it would be this internal conviction that this is true. Um, if we were to take that to like a proposition, like to believe in a proposition would to be simply think that it is true. Um, but in some things that maybe aren't as analytical as that, mm -hmm. I would say it could be as little as a belief that this is a, a fittingness, so mm -hmm. a coherence mm -hmm. to this mm -hmm. as well. Um, because I, I do accept that not everything will be, you know, premise one, premise two, conclusion, that yeah, it's just yeah, going to yeah, rationally yeah. follow. Yeah. But I think within like a Christian worldview, you could say that this this is a fitting piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Have you ever read anything by George MacDonald? I have not. I'm familiar with who he is, but... Oh, he's fantastic. Uh. So he has this line in Unspoken Sermons. To hold something with the intellect is not to believe it. Hmm. A person's true belief is what they live by. Ah, yes. Shades of uh, a certain psychologist who gets a lot of airtime on the internet. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, well, um, I, you know what, I'm not going to Yeah, about we're that. not going to go down that. I, I don't know that particular psychologist's work very well. Yeah, neither do uh, I. And, and my own views do not come from there. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I would agree with that, actually, that yeah. I, I do often, when I talk of worldview, I, I break out what I would say, like a, a creedal or stated worldview mm -hmm. and someone's functional worldview, mm -hmm. and that we can get to what someone believes by how someone lives. Mm -hmm. that, that they're, you know, if I say, for instance, that I don't, believe in gravity, right? Yeah. But I'm unwilling to step off of that ledge. Right. I don't actually believe yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, so I, I would accept that. I, th I think, you know, we, we, in the modern Western world, it's been highly intellectualized, this whole question, and that's partly, I think, a result of the Reformation, to be honest. Um, the, the relationship between belief and practice was a bit tighter mm -hmm. uh, and remains, I think, tighter in Catholic and Orthodox circles. And it's even tighter in Jewish circles. I mean, or perhaps it's even slightly at the opposite end of the spectrum. In Judaism, they don't even care whether you believe a lot of things. They just care, are you doing it? Are you living like a Jew or not? Yeah. That's the most important thing, you know. And so I would say, I would want to push back against the idea that belief means thinking something is true mm. in your head. Yeah. I would rather say, my beliefs are manifest in the way I choose to live my life. And some things will sometimes not feel true to me. Mm. I can't choose whether they feel true to me or not. It's just my feelings, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, sometimes, and, and, and Protestants can understand this if they go to the Bible. There's some pretty weird stuff in the Bible. You know, there's a verse in, in the Gospel of Matthew, after Jesus dies, a whole bunch of people come out of their graves and no walk around. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. Do I believe it? You know, it, it doesn't... It doesn't sound like something that's likely to happen to me. But I live my life as if that was true, in the sense that I live my life as if everything in the Bible is true. Whether or not something feels to make, seems to make sense or, or feels right or I'm intellectually convinced of it. I don't think God even really cares whether we're intellectually convinced of things. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus keeps talking about not only those who say to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, not only those who just intellectually assent to Jesus' Lordship, he says, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a shift of focus uh, to the practice of belief that I think is required in the Western world. So what does it look like to live as if you believe that, say, Mary was bodily assumed? Uh, it means to become <laughs> Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like like to accept its place in the system, but not yeah. individually. Is that? Yeah, I mean, I don't think anybody's ever going to become Catholic if they have to become personally convinced of every different Catholic doctrinal position. Mm. I think that's still to be thinking like a Protestant. I mean, even if in some alternate universe somebody did become personally convinced of every Catholic doctrine, they still wouldn't be a Catholic. Right. I mean, there's the you famous C.S. Lewis line of like, yeah. even if he was convinced of everything, he doesn't know what the Pope comes out with. In a year, what the Pope's going to say, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, it, it's a totally different attitude, and Protestants can understand this attitude insofar as it's echoed in Scripture, right? If you if you're talking to a non-Christian and the non-Christian says, "Why should I believe every single verse in the Bible?" You know, do I really have to believe every single verse in the Bible, including that weird verse in the Gospel of Matthew? You'd say, "Well, no, that's that's not the attitude." 
the attitude isn't testing each verse in the Bible by some other standard of truth. The attitude is making the Bible my standard of truth. Hmm. Whether what it says, whether everything it says agrees with me personally or not. Yeah. And I would say it's the same, it's the same step for, for, from being a non-Christian to believing in the Bible. It's the same spiritual motion uh, from Protestant to Catholic is to say it's not about whether I personally can make sense of all the Catholic doctrines. It's about whether I'm going to let the magisterium become the standard of truth by which I interpret everything else in the world. Right. Which brings us right back to kind of the beginning of yeah. that, that question of how getting getting to the question underneath the question and, exactly. and investigating those things. Exactly. This has been fascinating. I've really enjoyed this. Thank you so well, much. Well, thank you. Any, yeah. any last things you want to cover? Um, I would just say that I think the role of virtue in acquiring the truth and becoming convinced of the truth uh, can't be overestimated. It's not fundamentally about how intelligent you are. There's very intelligent people who are just using their intelligence to deceive themselves ever further, right? It's not about intelligence. It's about having the quality of character to recognize uh, when people are speaking truth, just to, to sort of have the humility to receive and listen and learn. And that's going to get you way, way further than just being really smart. <laughs> that's all. That's yeah. wonderful. Well, once again, thank you to St. Mary's yeah. Seminary and University for having us. And if you all enjoyed this video, be sure to check the links out in the description to the work that they're doing. You guys seem to be doing some really awesome stuff here. Um, thank you so much. Thank you.